preserve people's willingness to pay, but we know that if you only need one, you have a high willingness to pay, so you get the high price. Consumers self-select themselves for the price discount based on their needs. All right. This one's perhaps one of my favorite. A two-part tariff. In this case, it's a specific case with homogeneous consumers. That is, all consumers are alike or similar. So a two-part tariff has two parts. A per unit price price you pay for every single unit, and let's say that that price is P, and we're going to set that per unit price equal to the, uh, the cost of production, and we're going to sell Q units. So if price is equal to cost, right, our profit comes from the difference between price and cost. If price is equal to cost, then I don't make any money off those unit sales. Right? Mm -hmm. So how do I make my money? And that's, this, that's the second part of a two-part tariff. And we call it a tariff. And essentially I say, I'm going to let you buy this product basically at my cost, right? Literally at my cost at this really low price. In fact, if I lower price anymore, I'm going to lose money. But I'm going to let you buy this thing at cost, but you're going to have to pay me for the right to do that. Like a tariff. And I'm going to set that tariff equal to that triangular area. And we can call that tar tariff a membership fee to shop at my club. Like Costco? Like Costco, exactly. They don't make a whole lot of money off the per unit products. And Costco is, is, if you've ever, as a vendor, if you've ever dealt with Costco, they're vicious in their pricing. Um, they haggle just, they demand these low prices, or they just simply don't offer it. Um, I know people in the wine industry that say, look, if you see our wines at Costco, buy it. Sometimes it's cheaper than what I can get at my, my, my employee discount. That's you like how to make certain things just for Costco, too. Like yeah, they exactly. They have a wrap coming up that's yeah. just for Costco. Yeah. Or they took brandy off the market yeah. for like a week. Who the hell buys week? 10 gallons of mustard? Right? <laughs> a restaurant. Well, a restaurant, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, that's good if you like mustard. It's, it's, it's good. Uh, but this is the idea behind that. Fine, I'm not going to make any money, but I'm going to make my money off those membership fees. And that's how I make my money. And if you think about it, like a health club, a health club, you know, they, set their mem they, they set their per unit price. Well, if I join a health club, how much does it cost to go work out? Depends how long you're a member. If I want to go work out right now, how much does it work out? How much does it cost me? Nothing. 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 Exactly. So they set their per unit fee at zero. And think about it. The lower I set that per unit fee, what happens to consumer surplus? It gets bigger and bigger so that my membership fee can get larger and larger. So health clubs will set that membership fee to zero, I'm sorry, that, that per unit fee to zero, charge a large membership fee, and that's where they make their money. In fact, they don't even care if you show up. They, they're actually banking or betting on the fact that you never show up. You'll join right after the holidays, after Christmas or Thanksgiving, after you've gained a couple pounds. But they're never going to see you again. They know that. And that's good, because they're still going to bill you for that membership fee. So this is a, a, a two-part tariff. Pretty, pretty common, again, Costco's, uh, health clubs, country clubs, right? What's it cost to get into a country club nowadays? That's, yeah, it's usually a couple hundred thousand. And to play golf, it's usually pretty cheap. In fact, sometimes it's free. I forgot someone told me at the Sonoma Valley Golf Club, it's like three bucks to play golf. Yeah. What's that? You've got to be a member, though. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. It should be free if I gave you 100 grand. 
Exactly, that's the point. They, 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 don't, they don't really make any money off their, uh, off their per unit fee. My coworker's brother is a caddy at one of the ones in Monterey that's like a super fancy one. Yeah. And he makes like every day that he caddies, and he like does it like a couple times a week, he makes like at least $500 per tips. person in tips. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. He makes like more than she does. And she has like a job, and, he's like, and she has a job. job. Yeah. She's like a job. I've never played golf, and that's one of my bucket lists is to die never playing golf. Never <laughs> having played golf. So um, I have a reverse bucket list. Things that I don't ever want to do. Uh, all right. Um, telephone service. All right. Monthly fee and unlimited minutes, that kind of thing. Um, so... Or, or internet access, um, things like that. Text, uh, text messaging, now you pay a flat rate and you get unlimited uh, text messages. Dude, I had a friend that his daughter ran, I think it was a $6,000 text fee oh my. in one month. They don't count it? They, they ran up a bill for $6,000 in text. <laughs> If that was my daughter, I wouldn't have a daughter. You know, <laughs> I'd still be saying, eh, I don't know what happened. She <laughs> just walked off one day and disappeared. <laughs> OJ and I are still looking for her. <laughs> that is on film. <laughs> <laughs> that is on film. Well, that is on film. <laughs> In case it ever happens. Yeah. We're all here. Um, no, that's uh, that's insane though. I mean, that that's why you have these you know, high monthly fees for like me. I don't text. I, I don't. I don't ever text, so I don't really care. But I don't even know how you can you rub your thumbs down to the nub. <laughs> uh, perhaps one of my one of my favorite examples is uh, printers and ink. Right? HP doesn't make money off printers. What do they make money off? Ink. Ink. Money off ink. Exactly. Uh, in fact, if you buy a computer, if you go to Best Buy or or uh, one of the Staples or one of those places. 50 bucks for the printer and 35 bucks for the ink. Oh no, if you buy a computer, they'll just throw in a, a, a printer because they, uh, they know you're going to be back for the ink. I bought a, uh, uh, a color printer and my whole paycheck was going to ink. Well, I got three kids, my whole paycheck was going to ink. It's like, oh, look at the pretty butterflies. Yeah. We need more ink. Uh, finally, I said, no, we, I went and bought a black and white printer, enough with the you know, wall full of butterflies and flowers and every other color <laughs> picture you can imagine. So uh, it gets expensive. It's like 80 bucks of, of color for those things. Yeah. That's a two-part tariff. Uh, amusement parks, you pay one fee to get in. Uh, I don't know if any of you are old enough, but Disneyland, you, had to, you, you paid uh, a fee to get in. Then you had to have tickets to get on the rides. Mm -hmm. And the tickets had letters, like an E and a B and a C. And, uh, the more popular rides are more expensive. What's that? None of us are that old. You're, you're, yeah. Okay. No. So, for, so now it's just a flat fee. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> He's not even I'm quite the Disney goer, and they just like I run a lot of races there, and they just 2016 they raised a lot of their prices and cut off a lot of yeah. their or like lowered their um, work with. But they no longer charge people. for they no longer charge for rides. No, but food is like yeah, yeah. an arm. Uh, that's another example is uh, you know, food at amusement parks and, and uh, uh, popcorn at uh, movie theaters. Uh, they try to get popcorn, uh, they don't want to charge too much for popcorn because other people don't want to go. So it's kind of a combination price, it's a two-part tariff. They want you to come in, but they're gonna, they also want to make money off the concessions. So uh, amusement parks, uh, rental cars, uh, mileage, and all those kinds of things. So pretty popular two-part tariffs. This is with homogeneous consumers. It's pretty easy if you assume that all of my consumers are the same. Um, for example, country clubs, you probably have relatively homogeneous consumers. If you have heterogeneous consumers, where you have different kinds of consumers, different groups of consumers that differ in their willingness to pay, for example, then things get a little bit more difficult. So let's say we've got two kinds of consumers, type A and type B. Let's try to institute a two-part tariff. Uh, we'll set the price per unit at the same price we had before, P1. 
But now how do we set, and at that price, consumers of type A will buy Q1A, consumers of type B will buy Q1B. Um, before we set the tariff to the entire area of consumer surplus. So, you remember, ah, I can't do it. But before we set the tariff equal to this entire area of the triangle. But if we do that, it's going to be greater than the consumer surplus of consumer A, because consumer, consumer A surplus is just that triangle. So we can't set we can't set the tariff equal to the surplus of consumer B. Consumer A won't buy it. I guess this is all in the PowerPoint. Good for me. Consumer A won't buy it. Consumer A is referred to as the marginal consumer. And the marginal consumers are consumers are the first ones to drop out, out of a market. Right, your marginal consumers are the consumers that are going to drop out of your market first. They aren't going to join this club or whatever it is. Because that area of, con that area of the tariff, tariff is greater than their consumer surplus. And remember what consumer surplus is. It's the value that you're, it's the maximum price that you're willing to pay. And it's greater than that surplus, so you're not going to pay it. So you have to set the tariff equal to the consumer surplus of the marginal consumer. So what are my profits? Remember, I'm not making any money off my per unit profits. I'm making my money off of the tariff or membership fee. So basically, it's going to be, if I set my, me my membership fee, my tariff equal to the surplus of the marginal consumer, consumer A is going to pay it. And clearly, consumer B is going to pay it because their consumer surplus is that really big triangle. So my profit's going to be two times that, um, that triangular area. Now here's where the problems start with two-part tariffs with heterogeneous consumers. What if I tried a different combination of prices? What if I raise price to there? I'm going to raise the per unit pri price. So I'm not going to charge that zero profit per unit price. I want to charge a price of P2 so that I make money off my unit sales. If I charge a higher price, then what happens to the tariff I, was, I charge relative to the tariff I was charging before? It's, it's going to get smaller because we can see that that triangle, which used to be here, is now going to be there, so my tariff, or my membership fee, or whatever you want to call it, is going to get smaller. Now, the question is, do I make more money or less money? So, what happens to profits? Well, we know we're going to get that triangle's profits, but we also know that we're going to get, I mean, this is my price, and P1 represents my cost, so I'm going to make this much per unit. So from consumer 1, I'm going to make this much in profit. So I'm going to recapture some of that lost tariff in my per unit fee. Times two, so I lost that. So this is what I lost from my tariff uh, before, right? So this used to be tariff, is that right? This used to be tariff, the blue. I got it from both consumers, so I'm going to double it. And by doubling it, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to take this and flip it over like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I can show what double that looks like. So that represents my lost profit from my higher tariff. Am I able to make it up? 
All right, so let's see if we can figure this out. I'm able to get that times 2, plus I'm able to make this much in per unit profits from consumer 1, because they buy this much, I make this much per, prop, per unit, this total area is profits. So I'm able to capture some of the profits that I lost from my lower tariff. But also, consumer type B is going to buy, so that's profit from unit sales for A. Consumer B is going to buy that much. So not only do I get this area from consumer A, I get this area, then plus that area from consumer B. So remember that blue area represented the lost profits. Have I made more profits? So that's my lost profits. I get that much in profit. Again, I'm just kind of taking this profit and shifting it down so we can compare the two. And I'm making that much from consumer B. So what happens to my profits? Do they go up or down? You got a 50-50 chance. Yeah, they went up. They have to have gone up. Just think about it. Or actually, not even think about it. Look at it. Um, I Recaptured the loss and exactly. Some. Exactly. I recaptured the loss and some. So this rep, the blue represents the loss. I got some of that back from my unit sales from consumer A. So I got this back. And I got all this back from consumer B. So clearly this is gonna right is gonna is gonna overwhelm that. So Profits went up. Does that make sense? These are complicated things. Profit increases. All right. So like most things, something feels good, what do you do? You do it again, <laughs> right? If profits went up by, if, if raising price resulted in higher profits, what should I do? Try it again. So, again, do I have to go through it? Oops. It's really an iterative process. So. I would try a higher price again, P3. If I charge a higher price, my tariff's going to go down. My membership fee's going to go down. And then I want to compare my profits. I want to see if the money I make back from the unit sales is going to compensate me for the losses in, for the loss in the membership fee. <clears throat> now, you guys are going to have to do this stuff. Um, but in my, my micro theory class, uh, I actually have them do the math for this, and it's, it's brutal. It's brutal. By the way, I gave a test in my micro theory class, and out of 40 people, 30 fit. It was awesome. I just gave my second test, and they did a little bit better, only 25 fit. It's pretty cool. I love this job. All right. Um, so this is an iterative process. You've got to keep trying these until you find the combination. So you keep trying it. You keep raising price, lowering the, the tariff until profits increase. At some point in time, profits are either going to decrease or stop increasing. And that's when you stop. So it's, it's literally an iterative process. And firms go through all these different combinations of tariffs and per unit fees to find the one that maximizes their profit. That's why when you go, when you sign up for a, a cell phone service or cable service, they have menus of options, right? Do you want to charge? Do you want a low membership fee, but charge a high per unit fee? 
or do you want a high membership fee and charge that zero price, zero profit per unit fee? Right? If we go back to the cell phone or the, the texting example, what do you want to make sure, what kind of plan do, you want, do I want to make sure my daughter has? Unlimited. Unlimited, which means I'm going to have a high monthly fee, right? But it's going to be unlimited text. So for me, I don't text at all, so I want as low of, of a monthly fee as possible because I, I'm not going to text, I don't, I don't text all that often anyway. I still haven't gotten into the texting thing. That's why we have these menus of, of, of options. Uh, heterogeneous consumers means that you're going to have different demands, and you've got to go through these kinds of processes. This is becoming more and more popular in things like, um, well, you know, kind of setting these things up as taking a product and making it a service, for example. Um, software is going that direction, right? You used to be able to go into Best Buy and grab a box of uh, Photoshop off the shelf. You can no longer buy a box of Photoshop. What do you have to do? Subscribe to it. To subscribe to it. Adobe went exclusively to this subscription-based pricing where they charge you a monthly fee and that's how they're able to monitor your usage and now, and now you just have this flat rate monthly fee and you can use it as much as you want. Microsoft Office 360 now is a subscription. Um, more and more firms are going to this subscription-based pricing, kind of like Costco. It worked for Costco. Uh, everyone wants to move in that direction. Wine clubs. Right? So um, moving to moving to this kind of pricing is uh, uh, where things are going. Lexus tried to sell a car that you couldn't buy. You could only lease. It was their high performance, oh, okay. yeah. So when it first came out, you had to fill out an application, um, and you had to qualify to be able to lease it. Do you like long drives on the beach? Exactly. So they wanted to make sure only the beautiful people had these cars, and um, it didn't really work out. So now you can actually buy them. But they, when it initially came out, they tried to have it just as a subscription sort of product only. So. When uh, Adobe switched to um, when Adobe switched to the, this pure subscription-based pricing, and all their products are now subscri subscription-based, when they uh, switched to that, they brought in one of the top pricing analysts in the world to help them with their pricing. And uh, anyone know who that one would have been? <laughs> What'd you say? You. Uh, yeah. This is awesome. This is an extremely powerful pricing tool. Um, not a whole lot of people in the world can do this stuff. So this is pretty cool. We're actually not going to do it, but we're just kind of covering this. Um, OK, so sometimes it, makes, it may make sense. Remember what I said. The marginal consumer, in this case, consumer A, they're the first one to drop out. Sometimes it makes sense to just say, look, these marginal consumers are starting to get on my nerves. So I'm going to set my price at that zero profit price. And I'm going to serve exclusively consumers of type B. Type A is not going to buy it. But it may make sense that this profit might be more than the profit I was getting from, the, from my two-part tariff when I, had to, when I serviced both consumers. So this is going from, yeah, I got two types of consumers, some that really like my product, some that kind of like my product. But I'm just going to ignore the people that kind of like my product. I don't really care, right? It makes sense sometimes. It's like a Ferrari. I like Ferraris. I want a Ferrari. But guess what? Ferrari doesn't offer one for me. At a, yeah, they're, they're expensive. Uh, cheapest one is now, is now 250 grand. So you, uh, entire, you exclude entirely those marginal consumers. 
and you keep that whole area as profit. So you go back to that kind of homogeneous consumers, which really you are doing, because now you've, since you're ignoring consumer A, you do have uh, homogene homogeneous consumers of type B. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and then you can basically you can offer different options and let them select, um, you know, which one. So there's there's a um, what do we have there? We had a high tariff, low per unit fee. This would be high volume users, like we said, the people that text a lot. And this is a low tariff and a high per unit fee. So people that don't use this thing very, very often. So let consumers self-select themselves which plan they want, which is how a lot of firms, like how, how pricing gets done for cable, for example. Right? Uh, you've got all these different packages for cable, and that's exactly what those are. They're, they're two-part tariffs. You want a low monthly fee in a lot of channels? No. Low monthly fee with not very many channels, or a high monthly fee with a lot of channels? All right, other forms of second degree price discrimination, airlines. Remember what <laughs> second degree price discrimination is. We tell, the, we, tell the, the, um, we tell the sellers what we're willing to pay. So how do they know that we're willing to pay a lot for a flight? How do, how do airlines know that we're willing to pay a lot for a flight? Keep booking last minute. Exactly. If I call the airline and say, look, I need to be in Chicago tomorrow, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to charge you a different price than if I said, look, I need to be in Chicago in two weeks. And those prices can be very different. Mm -hmm. Even though it's on the identical plane, you're going the identical distance, the cost is exactly the same. But by me telling them I need to be in Chicago tomorrow, they're going to say, you're going to pay this high price. Uh, versus if I plan it ahead. So airlines engage in this kind of uh, uh, length of stay and how early you, you book a flight. It's a milk run, or if it's non-stop. Yeah, um, intertemporal pricing, where intertemporal just means over time, All right? So you got peak pricing. Uh, if I want to go to a nice vacation spot during <coughs> peak peak uh, uh, vacation, then I'm going to pay more than if I want to go in the middle of the winter. Um, or in this case, yeah, they charge you more for first-run movies or books um, than for paperbacks. How long do you want to wait for the lower price? You want to have to wait long enough so that the high-demand consumer purchases it now, but you don't want to wait it too long so that people's interest kind of wanes and dies down. So that optimal period between high price and low price. Uh, frugalness, hurdle pricing. Forcing consumers to jump through hurdles to get a discount. Bought a TV at Best Buy and I was supposed to get a $200 discount and they gave me the receipt which was literally this long and I had to fill in all kinds of stuff, send it into the manufacturer by a specific date, and then maybe in six months I would get a discount. I'm not jumping through all those hurdles to get this discount. It wasn't worth it. So I didn't get my discount. Uh, coupons are a form of uh, hurdle pricing. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. Ah, one of my favorite, versioning. <clears throat> Releasing different products that appeal to different market segments. Uh, cars, software, hardware. One of my favorite examples is this. Um, and again, you've got to be old to, to remember this. But in 1989, Intel uh, introduced the 486, which was their fastest processor to date. It, had a, it was the first to have a math coprocessor which sped up the mathematical calculations. And it was a huge success. Uh, a couple years later they introduced the 486 SX which was 
uh, a lot cheaper and less powerful. Does anyone know the difference between the two? Yeah, you gotta be you gotta be at least my Isn't age. Isn't that the computer you told us about? Did I tell you the story already? I think so. Where it came out a couple years later, it was way cheaper, and they said they could never make it any faster or more robust, and then they did. They were the same. Oh. This is different. <laughs> It was actually more expensive to produce the cheaper one than to <coughs> produce the faster. The, what they did was they took the 486DX and disabled the math coprocessor. By disabling it, they, they simply, and again, that, that cost them money to do that, but they were able to, to lower the price and sell it as this 486SX, and a bunch of people that didn't want to pay for the, for the 486DX ended up buying the 486SX when they were exactly the same thing. So if you were smart enough, if you were one of those uh, computer geeky guys back in, this was 89, uh, all you had to do was go into the computer and switch back on the math coprocessor. And you'd have the much more expensive processor. So this was actually called, uh, there's a theory called uh, uh, damaged goods. It was a paper called damaged goods by, by these guys written in 96. And it's pretty common. It's, a, it's actually pretty common. So a lot of the times they don't even disable it. They'll sell the exact same thing. But you know, think about uh, the wine industry. What do a lot of wine companies do? You got this great wine, but let's say you got too much of it. So you don't want to put it on the market because we know if we flood the market, the price is going to fall. You want to maintain your nice high price. So you got to call it something else, right? Table wine. You, you relabel it. And if you know that, then you know, kind of like if you knew that all you had to do was enable the coprocessor and you'd have a 486DX, if you know that, you can go buy that generic wine. Who makes a living off of that anyways? Trader Joe's? Trader Joe's actually does a little bit. Uh, Cameron Hughes, anyone know who that is? What's that? Yep. What does he do? Uh, he buys bulk wine and turns it around. And relabels it. Yeah, so he, he finds those companies that don't want to release their wine because they don't want to flood the market and lower the price. Cameron Hughes buys it, calls it Cameron Hughes, and, and his are just la labeled with numbers, lot 62, lot 87. Uh, so sometimes you can get really good wines for really good prices from Cameron Hughes. Uh, and they sell Cameron Hughes wines at uh, Costco also. How is that legal? Why is it legal? It's both wines. It's you're you're not uh, you're not violating copyright because you're. Oh, okay, I get it. Never mind. I'm sorry. I thought he was like buying like the actual bottles. Is he? No, they buy. No, he's in buying. Bulk. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I have seen situations where they well, actually take off the labels. Out. But no, they take off. But they yeah. do it legally. Yeah. They take off the labels and they relabel it as a store wine. That's crazy. Yeah. So there's a. Uh, it's what's that? Also, does that, that with their vodka? vodka? The Kirkland vodka is actually free vodka. No, it's not. I've, I'm serious. No, it's not. I've heard it on multiple occasions. It's a myth. Oh, it is? Yeah. It is. Oh, it's just 